Come on. Her name is... Alina Starkov. Alina Starkov. Derek. And I'm Noah, and you're listening to A Bite Up, where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession and we enjoy it one nibble at a time. Yay. So, <laughs> you know, when you have a thought in your head and then you're about to say it and then it literally just poofs out of your brain, yeah, that's, what, that's what just happened to me. I've never seen someone be so confident in what they're going to say and the second they go to say it have absolutely nothing to say. That was wild. Well, hopefully that's not how the rest of this episode goes. <laughs> but welcome, welcome, welcome. We are officially going to be talking about the TV show Shadow and Bone. So the last episode we had was about the book and about the universe. And now we get to really dive into what Netflix has created for us to watch. As always, make sure you're following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We have a Discord all of that stuff. Check out our Patreon, exclusive bonus episodes on there. You get to pick a pop culture property for us to cover or a movie. And don't forget to leave us a review. If you have a moment, go to Apple Podcasts and just give us a couple of stars, maybe five would be lovely. And just say a little something. We'd love to hear from you and we always appreciate your support. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So on the last episode, like Noah said, we talked about the book, we talked about the magic, we talked about all the Alkies. So let us get into the, this episode. So, of course, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler warning. You have been warned of spoilers. Let us officially take a bite of Shadow and Bone, episode one, A Searing Burst of Light. Dramatic, but I love it. So with shows that come from books, it's always interesting. I feel like whoever decides to pick it up, whatever studio and then the creators of the show along with the creators of the original source material, they're always having to, like, balance two types of people. Mm -hmm. There's the original fans, the people that love the source material, have been through it through thick and thin, created fan fiction, are crazy on Twitter for it, and then you have the potential fans from it. So I always, I'm always, always, always so curious on how these properties handle the balancing and feeding those two animals yeah. i would say because they can be a little ravenous at times so i was super excited going in to see how they were going to do this because if you've followed the series at all especially the books there's about seven books the first trilogy which is what this show is aptly named after is beloved but it's mostly the second little duology that came out that fans really feel like Lee Bardugo hit something good. It's like more beloved. People say that the story is much better and that's Six of Crows. So I'm super, super, super curious and really excited to see how they interwove the Six of Crows duology into the Shadow and Bone series because Six of Crows happens after the Shadow and Bone trilogy. So it be really cool to see those characters interact and how they're going to do this quote-unquote prequel for those characters within this show. So they're kind of creating a whole new story for the Six of Grows gang in Shadow and Bone. So it's going to be new for us because we did the one bit of research for Shadow and Bone, but these characters are completely new and I think new for everyone as far as their storyline is concerned. Yeah, especially essentially like a prequel for them. So it is cool to see how they started <laughs> yeah I, I mean i think that for the most part a lot of the readers are just obsessed with kaz who's the pretty much like the leader of the six of crows so everybody's like super happy and i just keep seeing things on twitter that are like you can't tell me that he isn't the perfect kaz freddie carter is kaz like everybody's just obsessed with him yeah yeah so we'll get into the six of crows stuff obviously as we talk about this episode so let's get into it as the episode opens, we hear a voiceover of Alina, and she's talking about how she never felt like she belonged in Revka. 
Mm. And that's because she looked like her mother and her mother looked like the enemy. So this is an interesting new development for Lena as soon as the, the series starts. Because in the book, I would say that she felt like an outsider because she was like meek and plain and, you know, skinny. And like, Wah. okay, that's... And she was an orphan and, you know, the usual, that sort of vein. Yeah, it's just the very stereotypical, like, ah, oh, nobody likes me, even though there's nothing wrong with her, really. She's just average. <laughs> <laughs> you know. We're all average, Selena. Yeah. Jeez. But now it's because she's half shoe. Mm -hmm. Refugee and people are racist. So right. that's an interesting development for the character. And I think it gives a little more believability on why she would feel... Oh, I feel different. Well, it's because she is meant to feel different. Right. In this. And and we even see throughout this first episode, it's not even just affecting her interactions with people that she's in the army with, but also you see just like sort of anti Shuhan propaganda hanging up as banners and things like that. So this is something that's being placed throughout her life constantly. Mm hmm Always thrown in her face. Yeah. Yeah, so we also get our first look at the Shadow Fold, which is pretty much how I pictured it. A giant swath. Everybody <laughs> uses swath. All of the people that made this show use that word. Even people online use that word. I don't know why this word is so popular with the Shadow Fold, but I don't want to break tradition with it. So. I mean, I guess it's like more dramatic than like a piece of darkness, a valley of darkness. It's I mean, like it's called a swath. It's called the Fold slash the Unsea. Those are super cool words. Don't swath. add swath. Swath sounds weird. It sounds like you're cleaning a ship. They just were like, they told the CGI people a swath of darkness. And they're like, we got it. We know exactly <laughs> what that means. <laughs> and just to give you a little reminder on the fold, the fold is, it, it has like politically devastated Ravka as well as like physically devastated Ravka. Do you have East Ravka, where most of the story takes place, where the monarch monarchy sits and has been blocked from most international trade and suffers from rights widespread famine, and mm -hmm. that's they hardly have sugar, so that's they're going through a lot. And we have West Ravka, which has been all but abandoned by the seat of power, and a separatist movement brews there. So other countries, meanwhile, kind of appreciate the fold. So you have. Fjorda at the top, you have the Shuhan at the bottom because it has like kneecapped an imperial superpower, you know, movement that way. So it might, that might otherwise dominate them. So it's kind yeah. of given them the edge. So it's like they kind of, they, they don't like the fold, but they're like, thank you. Right. And, and I even think with the Fjordans, they hate the Grisha. So it's kind of offered them even more control over Ravka because they know that if, the Ravkins go into Fjorda to get past the fold, they'll try and kill all their Grisha. Yeah, they, they burn them like witches. But don't call it magic, because it's called little science. I'm probably going to call it magic throughout this entire series. <laughs> <laughs> the magic of the series. <laughs> so then we meet some other cartographers mm -hmm. with Alina as she's in a carriage on her way into camp to the Shadow Fold. And we see some, we see one that does have a name and is a little more prominent in the book. I don't think the other ones really say their names, mm -mm. but we see Alexi for the first yeah. time. I do think it's sort of interesting that like they take these wagons to the camp, which is directly outside the fold, even though most of them are going nowhere near the fold. Why set up the camp? By the most dangerous place in all of the land. Well, as long as you don't go in, I guess you're fine. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. just chilling outside the fold. I mean, it has a nice little rumble. It has That's lightning true. in there. You got white noise when you go to sleep. Right. Who it's needs fine. the sound machine for sleep when you have the fold right outside your window? <laughs> so throughout the... And I'm assuming it's going to be like this for the rest of the series. We get our first little flashback. We get our first glimpse of baby Alina with Anna. And she's, she's the she runs the orphanage she's almost like the headmistress there this is where we kind of get a little backstory about the fold but we're also seeing that she's pushing her to be a cartographer mm -hmm. you know keep a pencil in your hand because if you don't somebody will put a rifle in it so you don't want to fight <laughs> yeah but also uh anakuya holds no punches she's like 
You don't want to go into the fold. The fold date your parents. Yeah. <laughs> it's like so awful. Please. But hey, one and done. We're like, oh, her parents are dead because right. of the fold. She's right. an orphan. Got it. <laughs> From like four words. I wouldn't have to deal with your stupid butt here if it wasn't for the fold, you brat. <laughs> and then in the same flashback sequence, we see Baby Lena and Baby Mal. I call him Minnie Mal. Ooh, Minnie Mal. Oh, yeah. Mal. Man, alliteration. Always good. <laughs> and essentially, he comes into where she is. He has a big little baby rabbit. He's a little soft boy. Yeah. He's like, you know, I want to save this little baby rabbit. Other boys come in there, try to pick on him. She stands up for him. Go back to present, and we see grown-up Mal. He's like in a Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes fighting match. It's a little old-timey, you know? Yeah, it's like it's like old-school Ravkin Fight Club. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah. number one rule of Ravkin Fight Club is you don't talk about Ravkin Fight Club. You don't have Grisha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. No magic in the ring. <laughs> I mean, that's how it, it seems like they're showing how the soldiers pass their time and more of like what the first army are doing. So the first army are everybody that's not Grisha. Right. Just in case you didn't listen to our first episode. <laughs> I mean, I would never think to pass my time by beating the shit out of my fellow soldiers. I mean, I guess there's prize money involved, but I'd be like, no. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a direct contrast to what we had just saw the previous one. So right. we saw Minnie Mal, and he wanted to save this little rabbit, and he seemed a little sensitive and stuff like that. And it seems like as he's gone on, he's been told like, "No, you need to get buff, and you need to beat people's faces in." Like, <laughs> yo, and Anakuya again, just in that flashback, she, yo, she knows he has a rabbit, and then she's like, "Bring me a fat rabbit before dinner." Yeah, I mean, it seems like. I mean, she doesn't seem great, but she also, I don't know. Like, she, I think she's, she's like, I'm pro- doing this for the paycheck. Well, and probably to toughen them up because they're like, this world sucks, guys. Mm. There's a shadow fold. And Grow if you up. ain't Grisha, nobody's going right. to love you. <laughs> so in this fight, Mal wins and we meet our first Grisha. He's a squalor. He has no name. But it's cool to see initially the powers that they have. You know, it's, he steps up to Mal and he's like, why don't you try to fight me? And it's like, come, why? Why? Always got to ruin it. Yeah. Always got to ruin it. This isn't a pissing contest. We get <laughs> it. You can control wind. Okay. We're using our fisticuffs. <laughs> but I think the, the point of this scene was just to show that, you know, the Grisha are a little, um, at least some of the Grisha are a little like highfalutin. Showboaty. Yeah. And like. Think that they're better than the first army. So the Grisha are the second army. They're the first army, which is a little weird. I I just don't know if that's, you know, they're kind of given this like olive branch because a lot of the other areas and Ravka and then and Fyrda and Shuhan. So it's like they're not treated well in a lot of the other areas. But in Ravka, the middle part of this part of the continent Mm -hmm. they're at least given a place in the army they're given a voice the monarchy appreciates them in some way so it it is interesting how they took that and it was like oh if i go north i'll get burned like a witch if i go south you know get put into slavery or killed or you know whatever so it's it's interesting that they're like hey thanks but y'all suck (laughs) we're awesome here (laughs) yeah after this fight and after this confrontation with the squalor Mal meets up with Alina, and her face lights the F up. Mm -hmm. Their chemistry is pretty cute. I was super excited to see how these characters would interact and how the actors would portray their friendship. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Mal already seems different in the book. Yeah, absolutely. In the book, Mal is definitely more concerned with other people, other women in the camp, whereas here, he throws his arm around Alina immediately. They're smiling. They're joking. They can't keep best friends apart for too long. They're just always looking to be with each other again whenever they're separated. I'm I, I'm one of those people that wasn't too much of a fan of Mal in the mm-hmm. books because I think he's famously like despised to be he he's arrogant, he's kind of selfish, and but Mal here seems more, I, I guess, relatable. Yeah, you know. And I think right off the bat we see more of who Mal was as a kid as an adult in the show than we did in the books. Because in the books, he's a sweet boy, just like he we were see, we saw here, but then he's like completely standoffish. Mm-hmm. Whereas we see him being tough because he has to be tough, but then he sees Alina and he melts again and he's the boy with the rabbit. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I thought the Archie, the actor that plays him, is doing a good job of balancing or or more doing soft corrections mm. with some of the characters. You, you know, because like I said in the beginning, it's interesting to see how these creators for the show and Lee Bordeaux is working on this and see what they change a mm-hmm. little bit. And it already seems like Mal, his his personality is changing a little bit. And it's just even in that first interaction, because in the book, when we first meet him, he is very much like concerned with other girls. And like Alina's like, oh, are you tumbling with more girls? And so it, it is interesting. It's like, will they, won't they, don't they type of thing. But it doesn't seem like that's going to be here. So I appreciate that quite mm-hmm. a bit. Um, as So she gets to the camp. Obviously, Mal has been there, and they start walking through the camp after they meet up, and we get to see some Grisha training to the side. Apparently, they had to move their tents away from where the Grisha are because they needed more room. So again, we're seeing like, oh, the Grisha are like, move your tents. We need more room. They're just coming in here and barking orders. Yeah, they just want to light poles on fire, basically. More room for debauchery. (laughs) They light poles on fire, then the squallers put it out. So, I mean... (laughs) The training is intense. (laughs) So, next scene, the meeting horns are blown, and the first army has a meeting. We do see some Shuhan propaganda posters that Alina side eyes that are clearly posted behind this meeting, the stage, which is like, oh, okay. It reminds me a little bit of... um, It seems appropriate. Mm -hmm. It's like Russian propaganda posters. Yeah. And it's like, this one is going with the time. Right. So I think it's interesting. But yeah, it's clear that there's some heavy racism in uh, Ravka. So pretty much what they're doing here is like a Hunger Games lottery picking of people on who's going to go into the Shadowfold doing assignments. And of course, none other than Mal is selected as the tracker for the skiff mm-hmm. going through the Shadowfold to go to West Ravka. Right. So of course, Alina is not happy about Mal being selected to go into the fold. Because, I mean, it's a death wish, obviously, to go through the The Shadow Fold is like this big, it is the big antagonist for the whole series. So you don't want to go in there. It's lightning, it's smoky darkness, and there's monsters in there. But now we get a hard cut to Catterdam. We've gone across the sea, folks. Right, and so this is our first instance of seeing how... The Six of Crows is going to play into the Shadow and Bone story as it goes. Of course, when I saw, I was like, uh-oh, we're having two different storylines in this. Great. This is going to be fun to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Things are going to get confusing. <laughs> so in here, we are in a saloonish type bar, a.k.a. the Crow Bar, where we first meet Jesper. So perhaps I want to say one of the better castings in this whole show so far. I mean... Kit Young's charisma as like the goofy gambling gunslinger is pretty great. I, I the first scene that he's in, he's checking on counterfeit money while he's gambling, and he does it with such style. He winks at the camera. It's great. I love this character already in the first couple seconds that he's on screen. Yeah, and he's like supposed to be at the door watching, and he is meanwhile getting into it with all these people who are gambling. And, you know, apparently to check for a legal tender, you got to chuck a coin in the air and shoot it. I mean, that's his gunslinger. They're showing you right <laughs> off the bat. Hey, he can aim. He got that sharp shooter action. <laughs> yeah. I did like this little, this first introduction of this first crow because it's, it's, it softens the harsher entrance of the dregs leader, Kaz Brecker. Because mm. he, he comes in and he's very like, rah, rah, rah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he has that cane. Yeah. With a golden crow atop of it. <laughs> I mean, stylish. Which, I mean, I guess we're going to learn about later, right? Because he uses the cane because it does look like he, walk with, he walks with the limp. Correct. So yes. we have to figure out why. What's going on? With How the cane or his limp? Well, his limp, right? Oh, okay. Obviously, there was some sort of accident. I mean, let's talk about the cane, too. Where did he get it from? Did he make it himself? It's gorgeous. <laughs> it's magical. So after Kaz catches Jasper showing off, he then brushes off another little like foot soldiery guy. Who offers to fence a priceless painting he's heard was stolen from a wealthy merchant. Unbeknownst to him, it's hanging up in Kaz's room. I mean, I've seen better paintings. (laughs) Hey, it's of the fold, the shadow fold, and it has a nice little scenic uh, field. Yeah, I mean, there's been, 
Of course there's You said painting. pastoral with a storm <laughs> in the background. I said wishy-washy oil painting. <laughs> but this is where Anesh, a.k.a. the Wraith, mm. a.k.a. Kaz's acrobatic and poyous right hand, drops in from the window just like a badass cat. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. She's super silent. She sort of just appears in the background. That's what she do. She's just like this awesome spy who manages to slip in and out of places, get information, and deliver it right into Kaz's hands. Mm -hmm. Just like a wraith with some knives. (laughs) Uh, True. (laughs) So this is where Inej tells Kaz of a job that offers one million Kruga. They need a team to cross the fold and bring something back. Apparently, the person that's holding this, the employer for this job, is having meetings tonight. Yes. That very night. And she also says that they have brought someone in off a ship. And they need to get information out of this person. So that's what she was able to see. They go in through these gates and she can't go any further. We also learn that Kaz is paying off Inej's indenture. Yeah. So there seems to be in Ketterdam this thing where people offer their talents for an indentured servitude. And he is able to keep Inej because she's one of a kind. And he wants to pay off her indenture. But, I mean, it's not because he wants to keep her. I think there's a piece of him that, one, wants him for his crew, but also wants to free her. Yeah, he also seems a a little, what's the right word? Egotistical, egomaniac, or liking one of a kind and best things. Like, he likes to collect things. Like the painting. Like an ash. Right. I I mean, I think with Kaz, on the surface, he seems very antagonistic. He seems... You know, like he just wants to be a collector of the finest things. But I think in reality, there's a real underlying reason for why he's doing the things that he's doing. Yeah. And Inej really feels, I mean, it does seem like she's appreciative of it. All right. So back in Ravka, Alina is trying to get food. And this dick of a cook is like, no, I'm not sh- serving shoe. Even though the, her other cartographers, a little crew, vouch for her. And like, she's Ravkin. Mm-hmm. What do you leave her alone? So fuck this guy. Fuck this prick. Yeah, not cool. And then for speaking up, he's like, "Well, then you guys don't get food either." Yeah. And then she's like, "Well, no, they're not my friends." And then she just leaves. Yeah, of course. I mean, what else are you going to do in that situation? Mm-hmm. So Mal did see this happening to her and her not getting served and not getting food. So what does he do? He goes to a Grisha tent and tries to steal some food. I mean, the rudeness of how fancy these Grisha tents are <laughs> is beyond. There's like rugs. There's lanterns. Oh my there's god! Just- so gorgeous. Grapes and cheeses just hanging out in a bowl. Curtains upon curtains, changing rooms. And like, meanwhile, the first army is like literally in a camping tent. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's awful. So we then again meet another squalor. So, so far, mostly squalors have had speaking roles. Lots of Wendy's. Yeah. As far as Grisha go. So he runs into Zoya. And if you've read the books and we did talk about her a little bit, she's a more prominent character. She's not just. Squalor number four mm-hmm. in here. And there's some flirting. You know, she, she flirts with him a little bit and saying that says that she likes to have a tumble. With the, a stranger. Yeah, the night before to calm her nerves. But Mal is like, no thanks, bye. He's <laughs> like, I'm going to take these grapes and I'm going to go. Yeah. Nice meeting you. I do want to say, though, I love that in the book and in the show, they use the word tumble whenever mm-hmm. they talk about sex. I remember seeing that the first time in the book and I was like, I don't. Are we t- floor gymnastics? What? I mean, I think about the doll baby tumble surprise. <laughs> tumble, tumble, tumble right before your eyes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> tumble, tumble, tumble. She should get a prize. Baby tumble surprise. Did you really want that? No, no. I didn't want that. Oh, okay. I was just like, how did you remember that? <laughs> oh, no. I just know the entire commercial. It's the, you, That song is just too beautiful to not <laughs> memorize for your entire life. <laughs> and then they came out with baby headstand surprise. Anyway. Oh, my God. Yeah, she just landed on her head. That one was weird. <laughs> that one wasn't as impressive as Baby Tumble Surprise. <laughs> so so after Mal denies Zoya a, a night of tumbling, Mal brings the contraband grapes to Alina, who is visibly upset about what had just happened. Yeah, she says she's brooding. Right. Which, I mean, you're allowed to. You're allowed to feel feel that way. You know, Mal tells her that his name was not chosen by accident, and she is, again, visibly upset that he does have to go through the fold. She tells him not to cross the fold because they've always been together. There's some flashback scenes of them running and laying down as they were kids. 
but he has no choice. I mean, he kind of has to. He, his parents were killed in there, so he feels like he talks about how he had dreams where he goes in there and he maybe finds his parents. So it's interesting that I think he feels like he should go through there to see what's what the hell's going on, what what it's about. Maybe he does see his parents again, which I don't think you want to. No. And he does deliver a line. He's like, I'll find my way back to you, which I'm like, I feel like that's going to come up again in this yes. show. And then Michelle Branch comes in and she sings, <laughs> find my way back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, so in this scene, I, I feel like Mel, 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 I keep saying Mel. I like Melvin. Mel. Melvin, yeah, that's not Melvin. <laughs> I feel like Mel is so obviously in love mm. with her, which in the book was not that way. Yeah. I mean, I think in this scene in particular, we see a lot of different layers of the two of them. We see him sort of as this older brother figure wanting to take care of her, looking after her, her then looking after him saying, don't go into the fold, you have to take care of yourself. They also talk about kind of their societal place where they're like, look, Grisha women scare me. You know, I don't, I never want to mess with the Grisha. They're so far above us. And then we get into this whole thing about their nightmares, their fears right. going forward. So this kind of like gives us a little bit of the emotional stakes between the two of them and also just for themselves in this world where this fold exists. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. The, um, the, uh, <laughs> the awkward don't want to risk our friendship tension between them is pretty apparent. And I'm just glad it's not like the nerd pines for obvious football star type thing. Because that's how I felt like it was in the books, too. Like, he was mm. this, like, you know, golden boy and everything. And she was like, eh, I'm plain. Yeah. And you won't like me. And so it, I think that is a little drawn out now. I think that how they're doing it here where they're both obviously in love. I would rather them not want to risk their friendship and that be like, oh, will they, won't they type thing. Mm-hmm. than. One of them just whoring around and the other yeah. one being like, I love you. Well, it kind of reminds <laughs> me of it was a book and then turned into a movie. It was Cody Keplinger's The Duff, mm, right, right, where right. it's like, well, we've been friends our whole life, but he's a super popular football star and I'm a nerd. And then right. like it kind of whatever happens. But uh, I also agree. And it's funny because we were saying that we liked in the book that it was like, oh, it was nice. Like right off the bat. She was like, I'm in love with him. That's it. I'm in love with him. Right. But he's gone for like but, most right. of the book. <laughs> well, whereas in this one, they take it a step further. It's like, oh, they're clearly both in love with each other. Right. Right. So we don't even have to wait for that. I'm happy about that. Yeah. Just when you thought we would see a kiss or anything, we're back in Catterdam. Mm. And our three of crows are meeting with various informants on how to cross the fold so they can impress the employer. So they're trying to cover all their bases on, okay, we're going to meet with this employer. We need to have X, Y, and Z. And it does seem like, so <laughs> it's like a job board. They tell certain people about this job happening and then you have to go do the interview for it. <laughs> right. And it's just funny though, because they're like, how do you get across the fold? And everybody they talk to, there's like, good luck. You can't. Yeah, we do. We get some dialogue on like the black heretic. So we find out a little bit about that and how the black heretic created the shadow fold. And Nej also mentions the Sun Summoner, but Kaz is like, that doesn't exist. Stop it with your religious hocus pocus. I do like this line where Jesper is like, well, he's the Shadow Summoner. Why doesn't he just get rid of the shadows? And Inej <laughs> goes, have you ever put out a fire by adding more fire? I was like, damn, that was good. Girl. <laughs> I can already tell that they're going to be great characters. All Just the three of these people, mm-hmm. their dynamic is so different. Yeah, I'm already really liking. It. I have to admit that the three, these three characters, three, these three actors, to me at least, feel like they have more chemistry than Alina and Mal do. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, but knowing what could possibly be coming up and Mal not really being in the picture much, Mm-mm-mm. I feel like that might be true. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe Alina and the Darkling will have more chemistry and they'll probably spend more Yee. time together. <laughs> Yikes. Chemistry, little science, kissing. <laughs> what? <laughs> little kissing chemistry. I did like in this same conversation how Jesper was like, why don't they just dig under it? Apparently. And Kaz says something, something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they heard Whoops. them digging. <laughs> Man, those Volker, they are waiting. They don't care by air, by, <laughs> by underground, by through. They're going to eat you. 
So, of course, one of Kaz's goons interrupts them and says that they intercepted a letter to the employer that they are trying to get the job from and says that they are in need of a heart render. So Mm -hmm. they need some services from a heart render. We then cut to Pecker Rollins. So this scene is interesting. He go to where you get a Grisha that you need to hire. You go from where Inej was from. Right. And the you orchid. Ha- the orchid, correct. And you, instead of just renting them or doing what the normal business does, this Pecker Rollins guy kills him? Because why? <laughs> yeah, apparently you don't want to mess with Pekka Rollins. And it's right. like a big deal that Pekka Rollins knows about this million Kruger mission that exists. He's someone formidable. And apparently he does not go about things lightly. No. He would rather use brute force and murder mm-hmm. to get what he wants. It turns out, though, that the heart render that he wanted was already was already rented. Sorry, brah. Sorry about it. Um, I also just Pekka Rollins. Whenever I hear it, I think of the Golden Compass, Serafina Pekka, oh. the witch. Yeah, totally true. Is it Pekka or Pekka? I think it's Pekka. Well, that's even worse. Pekka Rollins. No, I don't. You gotta say it fat. Pekka Rollins. I don't like the name. <laughs> well, I don't think you're supposed to like the character, so it works out. <laughs> All right, so we're now back in Ravka at this point, and we see images of a General Kirigan, a.k.a. the Darkling, arriving at camp. This dude's the Shadow Summoner. Interesting, already change for him, is he has a name. He has a name. Other than the Darkling. Yeah. And I, I think that's on purpose because I always believed that naming him the Darkling was really bad PR. <laughs> but that's just me. People know. But it's the, what they don't tell you is that his first name is Darkling. So it's General Darkling Kirigan. <laughs> Shadow Summoner. Shadow, the Shadow Summoner of the Fold <laughs> in Ravka. But we don't really ever get any clear shots of him. We see, you know, a nice little cape moment later on. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. You know, him stepping into mud, but no speaking lines. He said, my cape, black. My hair, black. My carriage, black. My soul, black. Going to the Shadow Fold. I mean, yeah. he's on brand. Yeah. It's a theme. He's like, I'm the Darkling. <laughs> it's all black. I mean, like, <laughs> get into it. I, If you know how this story goes or where it's heading, it's like, yeah, we get it. Black. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in essence, wouldn't it be like a little creepier if the Darkling wore like stark white but had like black eyes or something like that or just wasn't called the darkling because it's like that is an awful villain name true and every single time you hear it, it's like you're bad you're bad mm-hmm. oh you are bad you know so it's like man wh- <laughs> it's bad pr she put All that right. right out there for us yeah. <laughs> i'm not a fan of that <laughs> so i'm glad he does have a name mm-hmm. so especially for viewers of the tv show it's going to give a more layers more like oh this isn't the story laid out in front of you yeah you know he's just a human <laughs> so it's time for mal to set sail into the shadow fold alina and a latch last ditch effort to go with him and or to save him and or to put her face where her face shouldn't be she decides to burn some important maps then as the guy is the, the lead cartographer he's like what was burned oh just important maps she comes in and does a fake Katniss Everdeen. Is like, I volunteer. Yeah. I'll do it. It's like, oh, you were standing there. Where's your braid? You knew. I don't believe you. <laughs> but twist, she just doomed the rest of her cartographer team by being selfish and wanting to go with Mal. He's yeah. like, okay, you go. But your whole crew goes with you. Well, you know what, Alina? <laughs> Maybe next time you burn one map of West Ravka. Okay. Don't do all of them because then they need the whole team. But like, does the whole team draw on the same map it's like okay i do this mountain and you do this mountain or do they just take separate things to draw or maybe they do separate things like right, one's like surveying like... one's like describing oh <laughs> yeah i'm not too familiar with how cartography works and if it's a team event <laughs> so so then we see we see alina and alexi and i'm sorry but those are the only two names that i remember from this cartographer crew it's really the only ones we need to know i agree so, and it's the the other girl and the other boy that goes with them. As they make it to the ship, you clearly see that there's the first army and 
the second army. So there's Grisha on there. They use the Squallers to push air into the sails. They have Inferni on there in case anything gets a little dicey. Mm -hmm. And they're ready to go into the Unsea, which I I thought just the imagery itself is really cool because it's a desert. So it's not a sea. It's the Unsea. (laughs) Also, the Shadowfold's called the Unsea because it's not water either. (laughs) It's dry. (laughs) <laughs> right. But it's just cool imagery. So it's like a boat, but it's a it's a skiff. So mm-hmm. really cool. And I like how they use the Grisha to go in there. So as they're about to go into the fold, they're making their way that way. We get a little exposition. So this lead in Ferni, she explains that they're going to use a blue light, which is a little Easter egg for more the second duology, the Cricket Kingdom. It's called a corpse light. Mm. But that's why they use it. And I I thought that was cool that they're pulling things from other... It's People like to see it. People like to see little tiny little Easter eggs. So they use this blue light because it doesn't aggravate the Volcra. It doesn't let the Volcra know that they're there. Mm-hmm. They can't see it, mm-hmm. essentially. And as soon as they go in to the shadow fold, it's not that dark. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just want to say. I'm not even sure the blue light is doing much. Not sure why we need it. <laughs> To begin with, but that's fine. <laughs> we st- we see them passing crashed and wrecked ships. Volker are circling overhead, and people are starting to get a little antsy. And of course, in a dramatic turn, the blue light goes out for some stupid reason. Right. And some dipshit decides to light a regular lantern because everybody was not trained on what... Did they pick the dumbest right. people? Yeah, I have a lot of questions about this. Like... <laughs> Okay, why was nobody really briefed about what it's like going into the fold? They're like, oh, you're going on it, goodbye. (laughs) You know, nobody's like, this is how you have to do this. They they literally like, you're going on, you're on the ship, goodbye. Mm -hmm. Like, come on, we know this is dangerous, let's offer some more training. Why is there not more than one blue light? There was more than one. Well, then why was it such a big deal that the one went out? Oh, true. You know what I mean? Like Either way, down. Right, doesn't matter. (laughs) Um, Why is no one hidden they're like the Volker are so dangerous so 20 people stand directly on deck well especially the, the so we have the cartographers just on the ship yeah. well, on the main on the main part of the ship where it's like wait why isn't everybody just down below that's what i'm saying this is interesting or like build they're like oh i was i was thinking like oh well well they need defense okay well build places for people to stand where they're not so right out in the open and then, why are we using guns? They're very loud. Well, it's, it's a lashed effort. Why not arrows or something? Do you know what I mean? It's too primitive. Oh, gosh. <laughs> they don't have TV. <laughs> arrows are too primitive. I can't. Also, why don't they just go faster? These squallers control wind. Well, again, okay. Blast so I, them through the shadow foam. Right. But I think the point is to get in there. Like, if you go slowly and quietly, you will not disturb the Volcra. Mm. Anyway, those are just my silly questions that really have nothing to do with anything, but I was just thinking them because it's quite dangerous. And things get even more dangerous, but because that light goes out, someone decides to light a lantern with regular fire, and then all hell breaks loose. So the ship is on fire, Volker are attacking, people are getting fucked up, people are getting dragged and busted off of that ship. Alexi makes a run for it off of the ship, and Mal starts to be taken by a Volkra. Alina shoots that Volcra. It drops Mal. She goes over there, starts caring for him. And now she's the one being taken by the Volcra. But then she lights that shit up with her now manifested sun summoning powers. Aww. Something that's different about this is that in the book, Alexei gets ripped to shreds. So this was a big deal that he kind of jumps off the ship and in essence survives this entire ordeal. Yeah, we see him making it out on the other side. I do want to say, I feel like there was some missed opportunities in this fold. And to really underscore like how dark it really is there. Because the book, they always talk about how you can't see. It's super dark. It's just pitch blackness. The sequence in the show is lit like they're traveling by moonlight. Mm. So we can see everything. Which is interesting to me, like picture instead, the scene starts out pitch black with just the sounds of heavy breathing and the boat creaking, maybe a few flashes of lightning to illuminate the gnarled ships and trees and all of that stuff. 
Then, when the blue lantern goes out and the Volker attack, you can only see things being lit up by the Inferni. Mm. I just think, like, that's what I was expecting and that's what I pictured. Yeah. And this, I was like, oh, it's, I mean, it's just moonlight. God. You can see everything. Go, go. Yeah, go, it go, seems go. like light is still streaming in from both sides. I mean, I wouldn't go in there in the nighttime because apparently there would be no light at all. Oh, good point. You know, because it's still daytime. Light is still shining through. Yeah, but I feel like they did that in the book, though, too. And they were like, we can't see anything. (laughs) I could see. I mean, I could see at least like uh, 100 yards outside the ship. I think one of the strongest things, though, with the fold is that moment of when they first enter it. And it kind of feels like a pop. It goes from like regular world to this very eerie silent world Mm -hmm. so that was cool but yeah and i and i think there's just some imbalances here like that inferni that welcomes them on the ship she's like i'm really tough i'm an inferni this is what we're gonna do and then like the second shit goes down she's like it's like i don't know if you're experienced with traveling through the fold i thought you'd you know hold it together for at least five minutes i mean she gets fucked up though i'm just gonna say yeah she gets like slammed against the side and then taken off i was like oh this is why they need protective cages. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Over time, it's like, you dive with sharks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. It's the well, unsee. <laughs> we're not done with Catterdam yet. The three of crows are now with a heart render and they make their way to Dresden, the job employer. So turns out that Dresden is holding Alexi and they need a heart render to get information out of him. We also find out it's been two weeks since the attack on the skiff with the Lena. The heart render is there to essentially calm him down. Mm-hmm. So heart renders, if they're able to speed up, slow down, they, they control people's insides, organs. their organs. I don't know how acutely that can be. Like, can you like, I don't know, make somebody's eyeball turn all the way around or something? I don't know. I'm just... I say yes. <laughs> but she needs, they need her to slow down the heart rate so he can calm down and give information that he needs yeah. to give. Because apparently he has some traumatic lapse in his memory and he can't remember what saved him slash the skiff from being completely decimated by Volcra. The heart render calms his heart down enough for him to recall that he saw a sun summoner. Right. Everybody gasps <laughs> and Nesh is like, praise the saints. Yes, I was right. Take that, Kaz. I will take my money now. Bye bye. <laughs> so the sum sum the su- saying those saying that really fast. It's like sum summana sum summana sum summana. So, <laughs> so that's the first time we do hear of Alina being referred to as the Sun Summoner. So it turns out that she just exploded with light, mm-hmm. killing all the Volker around there, or at least pushing them away and saving everybody, including Mal. Yeah, this was pretty cool because it wasn't just like she killed the Volcra that were in her immediate vicinity. It shot real far big and dome. lit up the fold. Yeah, big pretty do- sweet. Big dome of light. Mm-hmm. So after Dresden essentially asks him, give me a name. What's the name? He was like, well, you let me live if I tell you. Not bad news bears. Yeah, not good. Anytime anybody says that, I'm like, that's going to be a hard no. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, Elena Starkov, he checks the logs. He's like, mm. Turk checks out. She was on that ship. Then shoots him in the head. Yeah. Fucked up. Not great. I mean, Alexei really met his same sad fate he did in the book just a little more prolonged <laughs> and shot in the head yeah i, know. I don't I know like, which oh, one's worse <laughs> alexi's gonna survive oh no he's not yeah so for he was tortured for two weeks and then he was killed yeah or in the book he was just ripped apart yeah so it's like both uh, horrible horrible fates <laughs> sorry alexi <laughs> so the crows are now tasked until sunrise to prove that they have a way through the fold to get the job because right. essentially kaz wants the exclusive on this he told Dresden that he would report him to the guild for not doing this the proper way. So it seems like there's honor among thieves here or mm. honor among heisters. You know, <laughs> there's a guild. So it seems a little organized and Kaz knows how to go around that. So I'm going to be interested to see what they're going to do to prove that they can get through the fold. Maybe that's where the Six of Crows comes in. But uh. I, I know from just as a forewarning, there's only five crows 
at that least we see in this, this first season. Yeah, exactly that we see in this season. So if we refer to them as a six of crows and there's never a sixth one, there is a sixth one. They're just not in this. <laughs> and I think it's super interesting that they are so like it's literally said that they are going to find Alina Starkov because right. she is the Sun Summoner, right? Which is completely new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're not involved in the first book at all especially at the beginning and alexi dies way earlier so and it's also interesting that it's two weeks so i feel Mm -hmm. like this is gonna very much be like they meet up with her at the right time sure you know yeah so i'm I'm, it's i think that's the coolest thing that they're doing with this it's like keeping people that did read the book super interested Mm -hmm. even people that read all the other books it's like oh how are the six of crows working in this like this is not what they're their heists were in the book. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting that this is something new for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Super excited. I I liked it. I thought the costume design was so good. Mm -hmm. And this, it really conveyed the, you know, the SARS Russia, you know, feel to it. It felt fantasy while also feeling grounded. I liked it a lot. Yeah. And I think that you definitely saw the difference between Ketterdam and Ravka and how they dressed and what it looked like. They did a good job separating the two. You were never confused of like, oh, where am I right now? Yeah. <laughs> um, and the the actors are doing a fantastic job of this whole new world. Um, yeah, it's really exciting. I can't to see because it is it does feel new, right? It's like even though I read the book, there's so many new elements that don't even exist in the books that it's exciting to see what's going to happen next. Yeah, I'm I'm so excited to see how if they change anything or like what new information they sprinkle here and there. And, Mm -hmm. you know, because I the characters that we're going to eventually start meeting are going to get very colorful. Yeah. So I'm super excited to see that. But I I wanted to get a better look at a Kefta. Mm-hmm. I felt like it was more in passing or yeah. like in the shadow fold where I was like, I want to see the embroidery. Let me see it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Inferni in this even have like fancy gloves that are embroidered. Yes. So yeah. there's like a whole lot of goodness that we saw to see <laughs> as far as the costumes are concerned. Yeah. But so far, I mean, I give this one a thumbs up. I was impressed. It it, it made me intrigued. You know, it's always whenever they, uh, whenever these streaming services adapt a YA book and especially when we decide to cover it, I'm like, please be good. Please be good. <laughs> I'm excited for some training montages coming up. I want to meet the folks at the Little Palace. I want to see the King and the Queen. I'm looking forward to all that that stuff. Mm, super excited. But, of course, an episode of Abide of would not be complete without a special segment. And with every new season of Abide of comes a brand new segment. So this season's segment is called Badass to the Bone. See what he did there? Yeah. So I will be taking women from history that are badass in one form or another to, you know, shine a light on another badass like Alina Starkov. Mm. So our first badass to the bone is Wu Zetian, who I am calling the Incredible Empress. Ooh. Yes. So at 12 years old, Wu Zetian was given the highest honor a girl in China could receive at the time. She was made a concubine. Uh-huh. I mean, it seems like everybody was given that honor. (laughs) So one day, the emperor took notice of her, and he promoted her to the role of being his secretary. Wow. She fell in love with... (laughs) She fell in love with his oldest son, and after the emperor's death, she became the son's concubine, which was a total scandal, because, like, never would it be that a concubine of an emperor would become a concubine of another emperor. He took his uh, concubine hand-me-down. That, indeed, he did, but with love. Oh, okay. Yeah. Never mind. Yay. So she and the new emperor had a son, which was his firstborn son, therefore the heir to the throne, Uh-oh. which put a target on her back from the emperor's actual wife and his number one concubine. Oh, whoa, whoa. There's a, oh, yeah. Of course there's a wife involved. Never yeah, mind. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when Wu Zetian's second child, a girl, died, she framed the other two women and they were executed. Wait. So she had a second child. A little girl and the little girl died. So it's actually sort of disputed in history. Some people say the little girl died because of like coal fumes in the palace and things like that. Other people say that Wu Zetian killed the baby Ah. so that she can frame the other two women. Oh, I like the first one. Yeah. So we're going with the first one, but it is disputed in history. And and she as a as a as a person is very disputed, which is which is very interesting. Mm. so she framed the two women they're executed she then marries the emperor and rules by his side when he died she then became the first and only woman ever to hold the title of empress regent 
in the history of China. Wow. So there's never been a female, another female. When was this? Empress. Uh, 624, she was born and she died in 705. That's a... I mean, that's a decent... Oh, well, yeah. that's when she was born. She only held rule for about 12 years. I mean, that's a long time, yeah. especially for the year 600. Yeah. I mean, people didn't live that long. True. You know, so, I mean, she, she lived quite a long life. Also, I... Oh. Okay, when you said badass to the bone, I didn't know, know that this also entailed, like, scary stuff. <laughs> yeah. Most of them are, are good, but this one is a little scary. Um, <laughs> but in her short rule in China, it was actually some of their most prosperous years. So what Wu Zetian shows us is that we shouldn't let society dictate who we can be. We need to take the reins and go for it with a little less death, hopefully. And possible baby murder. Yeah, right. possible baby murder. Mm-hmm. But what's, what's sort of sad is that she's historians and people, they don't want to look at her with praise because they say some of the ways she went about getting her power were really awful. Mm. But some of the changes that she made helped China be prosperous. But when she finally stepped down from the throne, her son took up the throne and he changed the dynasty name again. So she wanted her own dynasty and she changed it for those couple of years. And then when her son took the throne, he was like, no, let's forget about my mom. I want to go back to my dad. She's crazy. Uh, Yeah. She did some bad stuff. Let's change it, please. (laughs) But still, she has been the one and only Empress of China. I always think that's super interesting. That's like. The times were different, not giving an excuse for her to do terrible and awful things. Mm-hmm. Murder still murder, framing is still framing, and whatever else she did. But it, it's it's interesting that she still became empress, even though the means to get there was not traditional. Like, the, this is like a once in a million. I know we've seen this throughout history a couple times, but it's like, it's not often where somebody comes from the outside, mm. works their way up from servitude. Right into ruling the entire country so it it is just that alone is like okay i mean even if you did it for the wrong reasons or did the wrong things it's still pretty badass pretty badass (laughs) yeah and that is the first badass to the bone yay i'm excited for these ones i really liked bird facts last season this one i like a lot and for different reasons so many hearts for bird facts Mm -hmm. well All right. Till next time, guys. Bye. (laughs) I was like, we have to end it. (laughs) Thanks for listening to A Bite Of, artwork and editing by our own Noah. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram at A Bite Of Pod and on Facebook at A Bite Of. If you have questions, recommendations, or just want to say hi, you can email us at abiteofpod at gmail.com. You can find us on all podcast platforms. Please be sure to rate and review to spread the word. Hope you join us next time on A Bite Of. Bye.